the ceiling, laid in the misery bed. The rain is falling, the pain is peeling, laid in the misery bed. Lord, who put me in the misery bed? Oh, Lord.
Good evening. I'm Lisa Alvarez, editor of Why to These Rocks, 50 years of poems from the community of writers and co-director of the writers' workshops at the community of writers. Please join me in thanking Cornelius Eady and the CE Trio for sharing their music with us tonight, bringing us all in from the cold and warming up our virtual room. You will hear more from Cornelius as well as the trio later on. This evening, I speak to you from the foothills of Orange County where I live, the ancestral and unceded territories of the Tongva and Hashiman if we were gathered in the valley where many of us first met, home to our conference, we would be acknowledging our debt to the original people of that valley. For thousands of years, the Wasi, now called Washoe, lived there from snow melt through summer. The Washoe still live in their ancestral lands today. We recognize and honor their history, traditions, and care. Tonight, I ask you to consider the history of the land where you are as well, and what that history means to you and all of us in the present moment. For 50 years, poets and writers have gathered in that valley since the community of writers was first founded in 1969 by novelists Blair Fuller and Oakley Hall. In those early years, poets worked alongside prose writers during the same week in a program directed by Bill Fox. When Galway Cannell became director of the poetry program, he developed a different vision. It is Galway's vision that we celebrate tonight. Poets, Cannell believed, merited their own week and needed to use their time in the valley to generate new work. His generative model requires staff and participants to draft new poems each day. Some staff poets, such as Robert Haas, who succeeded Cannell as director, along with Lucille Clifton, Brenda Hillman, Forrest Gander, Sharon Olds, and C.D. Wright, and many others, returned to the valley year after year. Some, such as Kazem Ali, Patricia Spears Jones, and Evie Shockley, arrived as participants only to return as teaching staff. The participant poets who have spent a week or two or three or more include those who have gone on to publish and otherwise contribute to the literary arts in their home communities. Much of that work first forged in a week shaped around the workshop table and the dinner table, running bases at the famous midweek poetry softball game, or on the nature walks up Shirley Canyon, along the Truckee River and the shores of Lake Tahoe, has made its way into the world. And now some of those poems have been chosen for this anniversary anthology. This evening and this book, are made possible by the support of so many, not just the poets you will hear tonight and the ones you will read later on, but by organizations and individuals who recognize that the literary arts are indispensable, including the hardworking board members and support staff of the community of writers who have helped make this book and programs like this happen. So thanks to them and to Heyday Books, and its publisher, Steve Wasserman, and its visionary founder, Malcolm Margolin, who gave this volume the best home possible. Thanks also to the California State Library and the California Center for the book. And for giving this launch a home this evening, we are so grateful to the Mill Valley Public Library and the Marin Poetry Center. And thanks to all of you for making it here tonight, wherever you are. We are thrilled to welcome you to this pre-publication celebration. If you pre-order the book tonight, you'll be among the first to receive it in April. Today, on the one-year anniversary of the pandemic, after a year of such loss and many challenges, we so look forward to the day when we can all meet once again in that valley under those skies and stars, near the waterfalls and close to those trees and those rocks. 
Now, let me introduce tonight's MC, Chair of the Marin Poetry Center, Meryl Natchez, poet, translator, and critic, whose early work with Why to These Rocks was so vital in its creation. Meryl? Thanks, Lisa. I, I think my participation in the early work was to leave you a big mess, but I appreciate you thanking me anyway. <laughs> it was you who really did the hard work of putting the anthology together. Uh, I'm just really thrilled to be part of this all-star event. It's sort of like the World Series or the, the Oscars, except for poets. And uh, one thing about poetry is like, unlike movie stars or athletes, we poets don't get paid to actually write. They get paid to teach or to speak or to do other things, or maybe have a job completely unrelated to poetry. But we're always trying to steal the time to write from our other obligations. And I think what's so amazing about the community of writers and the poetry workshop is that it's a time where we do nothing but write, write, write. And I will never forget going on my first day at the community of workshop and meeting Galway Canal for the first time in which he said we were gonna write a poem that night and turn it in by eight the next morning and then do that every day for a week. And I can't tell you the amount of terror and exhilaration that that speech provided. His vision really was uh, so key, so foundational to the workshop. And Bob and Sharon and Brenda have really anchored the workshop for the years to come, along with all the other poets who are here tonight and not here tonight. And I especially am thinking of Lucille Clifton and C.D. Wright. Lucille's Little, little mantra, the house of poetry has many rooms, rings in my head all the time. And I think in this book, you're going to find many, many rooms of poetry. And um, it's going to be exciting for me. At least just arrived this afternoon. It's going to be exciting for me to read. And I think it will be exciting for you too. And I hope it, it can show you some of the magic, uh, the really indescribable magic that comes from that workshop. Um, I'm introducing Brenda Hillman. Everybody's bios are available to you from the link in the chat. So I'm not gonna give a long and illustrious bio because it would take way too much time. But I wanna tell a very short story about Brenda because uh, for a while, uh, I guess two years ago, um, she and Bob were uh, rigorously attending a vigil on Saturday mornings um, at the West County Detention Center to protest the local sheriff's complicity with ICE and holding de detainees there. And I went a few times with them. And one time we were ready to go and it had been a very drizzly morning. And Bre where's Brenda? She's not at the car, where's Brenda? Oh, Brenda is moving an earthworm from a puddle in the parking lot over to the grass. And I have to say that that level of kindness and caring is also distributed and welcomed by all the poets that she teaches. Thank you, Brenda, for everything. Thank you so much, Meryl. <laughs> and thank you for um, being such a great uh, participant and, and um, Mater D tonight. I, I, um, I have so much, my heart is so full tonight. Uh, and I, I, I want to thank, uh, of course, Lisa and Brett, um, and all the staff and all the elves and all the staff poets and all the participants of all time. Um, and those who are not with us anymore who have participated and helped. Um, and I, I first I was first up in the valley uh, in 1976 with my first husband when uh, Charles and Mark Strand, Charles Wright and Mark Strand had started it, uh, the poetry part of it. And it was meeting under a tent where there were about 60 of us under a tent, all sort of shouting out pieces of old poems. Um, so that was my first experience. So in 2000 and 26, it'll be my 50 year anniversary. Um, and I, uh, I, I wanted to um, come up with some clever anecdote, but the thing that came to mind for anecdotes, um, it, 
uh, one was on a nature walk when David Lucas held up his his iPhone with the sound of a tanager and a tanager appeared. Um, and that was that was a, such a quintessential moment where he where he did that. Uh, those those walks are so amazing. And then another moment that I was remembering was um, a, a marmot coming out, um, coming right in front of our, our window at the at the lodge. And he he looked as if he was in the shape of an E, and it gave me a poem. Um, so the, the poems I'm, or the poem I'm going to read, I'm going to read my, my poem that's in the anthology and C.D. Wright's poem that, that are in the anthology. And I um, was, was participating in anti-war work um, uh, in 2008 and um, going to, to DC a lot. And I didn't know how to access that material. And every time, um, every time I'm stuck, in some way, um, and I get to the valley, I, I, something happens that gets me unstuck. Um, somebody said something at dinner and it gave me an idea for how to hear a different way into a sort of, I wasn't writing narratively at the time, but this, this poem came forth. Um, it's called, In a Senate Armed Services Hearing. From my position as a woman, I could see the back of the general's head, the prickly intimate hairs behind his ears, the visible rimless justice raining down from the eagle on the national seal, the eagle's claw held pack of arrows and its friends. A fly was making its for sure maybe algebra cloud in the Senate chamber it fell to us to see how senators reshuffled papers, the pity of the staples, to sense when someone coughed after the about to be czar general said, I don't foresee a long roll for our troops. There was a rose vibration in the rug. From its position on the table, the fly could then foresee the soon to be smashed goddess as in Babylon. More perception had to be, began to be. Filaments rose from the carpet as the general spoke. The senators were stuck. What were they thinking sitting there as dutiful as lunch patrols in junior high? From my position as the fly, I could foresee as letters issued from the mouths like, general, I'd be interested to know. Some of the letters regretted that. Fibers in the carpet crouched. From the floor arose the sense the goddess Ishtar had come down to bring her astral light with a day wrinkled plan. From my position as a thought, I thought she might. She might come in to rain her tears on Senator By and Senator Clinton, on Senator Warner in his papa tie and Senator Levin, on Senator Reed and Senator Hill, rain tears into their water glasses Ishtar from Babylon, they had not met before they smashed her country now or never. Then someone, Clinton I think it was, but it might have been by, asked whether this confirmation will give breathing space for the new general to unoccupy. How did the dead breathe, Senator, from my position as a fly? And I forget who asked what isn't even in the same syntax of this language I'm trying to make no progress in, asked how the army would unoccupy, by north or south? A voice beside my insect ear said these senators all have their lives, kids with stuff to do, folks with cancer, some secret shame in a quotidian, the thing in front always producing panic, just like yours, the voice went, just like your life. I tried to think if this was true, but was too weak from flying above this notebook to pity them. From my position as a molecule, I could foresee 12 Senate water glasses. Each bubble had an azure rim. The ovals on the senators' heads were just like them. The breath they used when saying A for American interests made the A stand still. It had a sunset clause. They tried to say safety, but the S withdrew. The S went underground, would not be redeployed, refused to spell till all the letters stopped in astral light, in dark love for their human ones. Um, 
And I um, wanted to thank Haiti Books and Lisa and everyone who worked so hard on this anthology and Meryl's um, hard work as well. And really um, unbelievably wonderful um, experience to be in the presence of the, of the writers in this anthology. This is the great CD Wright. Obscurity and Isolation. The left hand rests on the paper. The hand has entered the frame just above the elbow to reveal a half rolled sleeve. The other hand is in its service. It holds a foggy glass up to a standing lamp. Motel furniture, motel paneling. From the outside, what light slips through the blind is gray, blue-gray. The phone rings. The hand, conditioned to pick up, hesitates, withdraws, before the ringing finally breaks off. And now, wonderful and amazing Sharon Olds. Can you hear me now? Thank you, love. So touching to be here. And I'm so grateful for having been able to be a part of this uh, community and to see the faces of so many friends. Um, I am speaking from the land of the Wappinger tribe in uh, what is now New York State, between the Hudson River and the Connecticut River down to uh, Manhattan. Uh, the Wappinger is an Algonquin speaking tribe. And I'm always thinking when I'm in the valley of the community of writers or when I'm here of uh, how places get named and, and that the First Nation people name things for themselves, not for a person uh, who has uh, looked at them. So the, uh, the Hudson is the Shatemuk, water two ways, the estuary of Manhattan down by the ocean. Oh my, oh my. Hello, my darlings. I get to start with a poem of Galway's with part of this poem called Exeunt, The Frogs. So I looked up Exeunt to be sure that it was the direction in Shakespeare, meaning they leave the stage, whoever was on exits. Exeunt, the frogs. A frog smiles. <laughs> I'm so excited the pages are just trying to fly right to each one of you. A frog smiles until its time is up. Its mouth opens like the top of a Steinway. Its bass voice rivals that instrument in volume and power. Many creatures, including us, when long bottled up, like to let go. At evening, the lecking of a bullfrog releases the repressed feelings of the day. Before long, we could be deprived of their voices which have sung us Earth's vespers continuously from soon after our idea of the beginning. Sorrow booms in a frog's resonating chambers, stirring alarm in the bugs, slugs, and woodlice who wait with diminished hope in its digesting chamber. Oh, so this poem is so exciting, excited also. Oh, I have heard of frogs dying off 
for a long time, perhaps since my childhood. Born into a brew of cadmium and mercury, they hop up and flee across a land of selenium and arsenic under cover of their fixed smiles with floppy feet and an extra or missing toe on endocrine disruptors. Why else but that they know we are moving toward night. During each hop, they scan for evidence. It is true. Exeunt frogs exit omnes. Galway Canal. So when I when I think of being there, hmm, I just am filled with feeling and gratitude. And one thing I remember is that during 30 years of going there, I learned how to hit a perfect line drive into the shortstop's glove, just like a wind-up toy. <laughs> and the feeling of connection was so much stronger than the realization that one, there was another out uh, for me. How wonderful to that we were able to swim together and uh, look for flowers together. And I think this poem of mine that's in the book talks about one of my uh, unofficial jobs. Mm -hmm. Which was, um, which I gave myself out of love um, to stand uh, beside Lucille at the beach. And if an insect came near her to uh, tempt it to walk on me and to carry it away from our beloved Lucille. Song Before Dawn, in the dark, not the full dark, woken by the cold, pulling the covers up around my mouth, making a small cavern of warmth of living breath, sensing the over under of my sleep loosened braids, all my arms and legs tangled around each other. I used to lie on this mountain and Galway and Lucille were dreaming nearby. I used to put on layers and layers by touch and despite my fear of being outdoors in the night, as if I were not a person but an occasion for violence, I would go outside, the sky black, as if, if there had been a god, it might have petted me on the head, like Galway in his scrupulous mercy toward me, like my chivalry toward him and are confiding in each other like a child in the woods confiding without language in the needles and cones. In the dark, in the dusk before first light, above the granite domes, which look from here like peaks, but are the knees and hip bone crests and clavicles, jaws, occipital arches under the mountains, fontanelles, the stars are still just visible and in the binoculars clear and sharp. But despite holding the heavy lenses, leaning, <laughs> leaning the adventure of life when you have shaking hands, <laughs> leaning against the stucco frame, my tremor shows each star swiftly whirling in a white gold ring like Saturn's in one direction, then swirling, then the other, then an hourglass, a spiral, a bed spring, the stars sparkler tracing my shaking. And now in the quietest moment, the voice it took the earth millions of years to speak, the vireo before first light. When my hands were steady, I would stand at Lucille's shoulder at the lake and softly pluck insects, nine-spotted lady beetle, 
giant crane fly, green darner, black snow mosquito off her shoulder, nape, white cap and blow them out over the glacier blue water toward the place where we're going, one by one, two by two, sometimes many at a time, someday all together as if reunited. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce someone from whom I have learned so much about writing and about family uh, and writing about family it's, and, and learning how, um, how much we learn from those who are younger than we are. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Greg Pardlow. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks so much. Uh, it's uh, what a what an incredible honor. Uh, as Brenda said earlier, you know, my my heart is full. Um, Galway and, and Sharon were my teachers. I did my my MFA at, at NYU. They were my uh, combined alma mater. And Cornelius, I studied with Cornelius back in the '90s. Kami Kanum. Brenda chose my first book for the Hanukkah Prize. So I, I, I am among family and it's such an honor to join this community. And I got the, the great pleasure of bringing my family as, as Sharon is noting. Um, so after a workshop, I would go back to the room and, and meet them and we'd have a quick meal and I'd start working on my poem and they would be getting ready to go off and ski for the afternoon. So they're not welcome back anymore, but, uh, but I had some good memories from, uh, from their, their, their joining me. Hopefully they'll be, they'll be back, they may, we'll see. I'm gonna start with uh, a family poem. This is called Metaphor. Metaphor. It means to transfer or carry, as a man might carry his namesake in his arms or on his shoulders, cheering, we bad, uh-huh, we bad, as my father did when he saw himself in me. As I came of age, however, I thought my father was, in the sense that means to hamper or impede, an embarrassment which is, as all language is, essentially a metaphor. I.A. Richards says a metaphor consists of a tenor and a vehicle. My father would point out that he's using a metaphor to define metaphors, a literalization. Like when Richards himself asks if a wooden leg is a metaphor for a wooden leg. My dad, Gregory Pardlow Sr., before he died, lost his leg to diabetes. Even though he himself would be the only person to see it, he insisted that the prosthesis match his skin tone. This is the same guy who gave me a Hot Wheels car for Christmas. A joke, see? He promised me a car when I turned 16. It shimmers on my desk now, a kitschy muse with shark's teeth decals behind the wheel wells. Before he died, I told him I would have preferred a matchbox car packaged in an actual matchbox, literalizing the figurative commingling of tenor and vehicle, more metonym than metaphor, a pedigree, in other words. He told me to get the stick out of my ass. Greg Pardlow is dead. Long live Greg Pardlow. Thank you. And now I, I get the, the great pleasure of reading another dear friend, uh, Cleopatra Mathis, her poem, After Persephone. After Persephone, heaven got sweeter. Its paperweight curve, star crazy at its purple center. 
she found a god, a weapon in the works, something I hadn't noticed in the field, fought out of the lairs and took her. I tore away the land's every color, withered the smallest grasses. Every heartbeat went blank. I dismantled the ticking. They, don't, they only say what I took, not what I gave. Roots and strong light, glory in the single shoot, green currency of the just born. From the irredeemable, the buried, this is how a self gets made. Remember, that darkness contained the seed sealed in the swollen red globe. Hell had to pay. Oof. Cleopatra Mathis. And now, another dear friend, we don't, we don't get to hang out as much as, as I would like, yeah. But uh, when we do see each other, it's, it's, it's always quality time. And I, I feel this, this weight just, just drop whenever I see <laughs> I just want to run and give him a big hug. Forrest Gander, what a, what, a, <laughs> what a wonderful human being. Thank you, Forrest Gander. Thank you, Greg. Um, watching those photographs that um, preceded our, our speaking and seeing that photograph of everyone in the dark um, yellow light of the, um, of the ski lodge where we go the last night, I felt such a whelming of feeling and connection um, to the people that I've met there um, and to the um, often really brilliant quality of writing. And um, it was at, um, it was with the community of writers uh, where I was the year after CD died. And um, at that time um, I was as Brenda says, trying to make no progress. Um, I, was, I wasn't interested in much of anything and I hadn't been writing at all and had no interest in writing. But there, um, uh, among that company, I, I was forced to write like everyone is in what Merrill talked about, that terror and exhilaration. And the poems, um, the poems for Be With, um, the major poems for Be With uh, all sort of broke loose out of me um, there. And, um, and I'll not forget that either. I can't read from that book anymore though. It, it's um, it's um, too painful for me. So I'm going to read a, a short poem from a new book um, uh, called, called Twice Alive. And the poem is called Immigrant Sea. Aroused by her inaccessibility, he aches for more of her life to live inside him, watching the breakers, standing so close he can feel heat coming off her wet scalp. What is his relation to this person before him, so familiar and foreign? The way he searches out her face, he searches out himself. Gusts thrash crests of swell, spring grasses twirl circles in the sand where they stand without speaking. She wants him to know it's all charged, even grass, positive, pollen, negative, so when grass waves, it sweeps the air for pollen. He feels electricity all around, as though the wild drama of the coming storm were already aware of them, foreigners on this shore. Little 
sapphire blue flowers speckle the dunes. He wonders if he has let himself flatten out into a depthless sheet like escalator stairs, whether in the end he'll disappear underground without the smallest lurch of resistance. But when her lavish face turns toward him, beaming, the corners of her eyes wind wet, he yields to that excess. He reappears to himself. And then I'll read a poem um, by a writer I met the last time that I was uh, with the community of writers. His name is um, Shang Yang Fang. And this poem is called Rider's Song. It is now time, said the crooked man, to know that after your meaningless meandering to make meaning, it is time to hold what was not told, but told regardless by a real toad in this imaginary cold that you young man will die before you get to Cordoba, meaning you with your black pony, red moon, never will get to Cordoba, let alone the dark tower where a girl, long hair, chestnut, whose name is also Cordoba, everything in Cordoba is called Cordoba, is calling you and you who've come such a long way, do not have a name, ache to be called by her so that you become real as that toad, except that the tower is not and the girl no more real than unreal is nevertheless calling you. But child, knowing you are not Roland the child, but a proletariat's son in a capitalist world. Are you sure to go on this meaningless road to make yourself a toad, my poor rider, who mistakes his quill for a dagger, who takes water as his mother, death by water, death by watercress, by the siren's music, which is only Odysseus's speculation. And you who sing to repeat a world unworthy to be repeated, and yet for whom dauntless the slughorn to your lips you set and blow, though really, really you know and know it well. Cordoba, Cordoba is perhaps itself aware that it is called something else. Shang Yang Feng. Oh, and now I get to uh, introduce the electrically innovative and fabulous Evie Shockley. Greetings, everyone. It is a true pleasure to be able to uh, participate in this reading and uh, join in the celebration of Why Took These Rocks, the amazing anthology um, that is on its way into the world, um, as well as 50 years of the community of writers. Um, I feel that the workshop, poetry workshop has been one of the blessings of my poetry life from the first time I uh, was able to participate um, through the several times over the years that I've been fortunate to return. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone who has um, made that community possible, participated in it, and um, helped it to grow, um, not least of all, uh, our dear, dear Brett. Um, so this poem was written uh, towards the end of the week, one year when, um, as we all know, you have begun to feel like you've hit the bottom of the well um, but there's the picnic, there's the wildflower walk, um, there is softball, there is swimming for some or waiting for others, and um, there are the drives uh, to and from uh, the, 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 the beach. And I remember having a conversation with Brenda, who I had caught a ride back with, 
um, and a few others that year that sewed some of the kernels that became this poem either later that night or the next night, but before the end of the week. And um, this is my contribution to the anthology. It's called Improperty Behavior. Racial profiling, the idea that there's no legitimate reason for driving while black. Take Sean Bell, he got 50 bullets pumped into his car for driving while black. Home ownership is also improper behavior in Cambridge and beyond. Ask Henry Louis Gates, arrested in his own home for thriving while black. Seemed like the Obama's celebratory fist bump might derail his campaign. Now they know they should avoid things like high-fiving while black. Inner city hoops are, of course, appropriate, unlike swimming in the suburbs. The Creative Steps Day Camp kids were booted from a pool for diving while black. Even b-ball can fall out of bounds if the finals pitched you against a wider team. The Rutgers women's players were slammed on air for striving while black. Post-Katrina New Orleans is open to anyone with the money to rebuild, except the Ninth Ward, which they're discouraged from reviving while black. It's all about belonging. Even now, who belongs where is often based on who belonged to whom. I sometimes wonder how I get away with living while black. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce the next poet, Cornelius Eady. Thanks. Go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Eady. <laughs> What an amazing um, evening. Uh, I'm so happy to be part of this. Um, listening to everyone, I'm, I'm sort of um, uh, reminded about how co-mingled my life has been with Squaw Valley, right? You know, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, most people think that writing is this isolated thing. You know, you go off to some garret, <laughs> you, know, you know, and disappear and then, you know, beautiful things happen, you know, but, 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 but really, you know, I, I think the best of us write because we're, 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 we're our lives are commingled with other with others, um, and I think I think that that's the energy or the engine where a lot of these things come out come out of. And I was thinking, listening to all these writers, just just how commingled my life has been with Squaw Valley. I mean, um, uh, I was invited to 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 uh, teach Squaw Valley. Um, you, you know, um, I got a phone call from Galway inviting me to come and read, which I couldn't believe. I thought it was my first impression was that it was some gag. So I'm going to put somebody up to, to talk by Galway Canal and, and invite me to come and, and, you know, and teach there. Second part was that, was that um, um, after that, after, after I realized it was, it was legitimate, um, uh, uh, that I got a phone call from, 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 uh, from Sharon. Um, and we met at the now defunct um, uh, Cornelia Street Cafe to talk and Sharon gave me some knowledge to help me finish my book, um, You Don't Miss Your Water. She doesn't remember it, but I remember it. Um, and, and it was very helpful at, at, at that time. I ended up teaching it at that. And it also reminded me of when I first, my, my first encounter with Galway Canal was actually when I was a baby poet in my hometown of Rochester, New York. And, and my first workshop in the world, uh, we were reading The Bear. You know, by Galway, and how we read it was that we passed it among ourselves. We 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 a few stanzas and then passed it to the other one. It was like co contraband, right? And so on this really just just really this incredible. Thing. Oh my God, he's gonna he's cutting the bear open. Now he's gonna go into the bear. Oh my God, you know, it was a mind blowing experience about what a poem could be. And as a baby poet, it never crossed my mind that I would ever, 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 ever be in a situation where I not only would know meet Galway Canal, but I would actually be be teaching with Galway Canal, but also be at Squaw Valley with Galway, Galway Canal. And, and, and Lisa, you reminded me of something of the interconnection between um, Kavi Khanum and Squaw Valley, right? Um, you know, and, and the basic DNA of Kavi Khanum, which is the idea of writing a new 
piece of writing every day comes out of Galway's head. <laughs> we adapted that adapt when, when we started we, we started Copy Condom. So 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 I mean, again, this is very it's all this is all this is just you know flooding me as I'm going here uh, as we're going along here, and it's such a pleasure to see everyone. Um, it's it's a pleasure and also an ache. Right, because you know, Zoom is, can only go so far. <laughs> you know, Forrest is so. Never, Forrest is great to see you. Really, I, 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 you know, I haven't seen you in so long, and it's like, oh my God, there you are, right? <laughs> it's right. It's like, oh, but it's great to see everyone. Sharon, oh God, <laughs> All right, you know. Um, but, but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read two poems. I was told just to read one and do it, um, do a memory thing, but I'm going to read two things uh, because because of Evie. You know, blame Evie. <laughs> also, I'm a geezer now. I'm 67 years old, so now I get to do whatever I want. Uh, but you know, but, but but it's one of those things where basically I'm going to read the poem that's in the anthology, um, if I can find it. <laughs> I thought I had it up. Uh, hold on. I do. And the great thing about the poem is that it's about the 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 the, the softball game, and is it is really. It's one of those poems where I, I had written it and totally forgotten it. It was one of those days I simply just wrote the poem and got it ready for, for, for the next day's workshop. And, and I have totally forgotten about it for decades. And it's, it's a nice surprise. Time out. We, did, we didn't grow up to be team players. The wordy ones, the shy ones, the smart ass ones the ones who burned alone or in small groups, who had this tick or far away look or dreamed while wide awake, too fat, too thin, too dark or poor or aware of our bodies, too restless or lazy or uncoordinated, in a word, doomed. So here we are on a baseball field in sunny, July in Tahoe City, California, in the middle of a week of writing. Back at Squaw Valley, our poems sleep for a day, our memories and longings and angers, our struggle with how to put it down, get it right, our nagging with the truth set gently aside. Tell me a grander beauty than a game, the heat, the dust, the slow rolling of hours, our bodies learning the swing, or remembering the last time our muscles spoke in that combination. Teamed up, anxious as raw recruits. Who counts the swings? How many outs? Who knows the score? Who tracks the innings? And we swing, we poets, and we miss, and we drop. Oh, perfect summer day when no one loses. And this is the poem that um, I, I also go back to this idea of how my life's been commingled with, with, uh, with, with, with Squaw Valley. I, I mean, um, uh, you know, I wrote my fourth book, You Don't Miss Your Water. Now, what a lot of people don't, they're prose poems, and what a lot of people don't understand or realize is that there's 21 poems in that book, and one third of that book was written the week I was teaching at Squaw Valley. Seven of those poems, that was, that was the week I was teaching at Squaw Valley. You know, all of those poems, the last seven poems, they were, they were, that's where I wrote them. So, 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 and, and uh, so, so there's that. The other thing is, um, this poem I'm about to read um, for um, Emmett Till was also part of Squaw, I wrote at Squaw Valley. It was because I was waiting for my poem to, you know, I was trying to write my poem for the day. And a friend of mine from um, Pennsylvania, who teaches in um, Pennsylvania, just used to teach in Pennsylvania uh, at Bucknell, called this, calls me up and, uh, and sends me an email um, and says this, this, this story about Emmett Till, um, his casket. And um, you've got to write this. This is your poem. You've got to write this. It'll make a great poem. And of course, when you get in those situations where, you, where people tell you there's a great poem that you should write, you know, this is the hazard of being a poem poet. It's like being a doctor. Everyone's got an ache. Oh, doctor, I got this little ache. <laughs> you know, so, so, so I was trying to, to sort of just keep my, keep, you know, fend my friend off. Then I read the story. Um, and I realized she was right. <laughs> 
And that was my poem for the day that I wrote at school. Emmett Till's Glass Top Casket. By the time they crack me open again, topside, abandoned in a tool set shed, I had become another kind of mess. Not many people connect possums with Chicago, but this is where the city ends after all. And I float still after the footfalls fade and the roots bloom around us. The fact was everything that worked for my young man worked for my new tenants. The fact was he had been gone for years. They lifted him from my embrace and I was empty, ready. That's how the possums found me, friend. Dry docked, a tattered mercy hall. Once I held a boy who didn't look like a boy. When they finally remembered, they peeked through my clear top. Then their wild surprise. I also hope you notice that in the background here, there, there's Lucille. <laughs> And I get to the incredible pleasure of introducing Bob Haas. Bob? <laughs> All right, I'll, you're gonna give me some, some yeah. air time. I'll, 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 you'll, I'll keep talking if you want. I'm trying to keep, keep it short. But I, one thing I, want, I would love to say about Bob is this, this is exactly that from my point of view, the thing about transition in an organization is that when it happens and it's right, everybody knows it. Everyone knows it. Everyone understands that you know if it, the change has to happen and the change is accepted because the right person at the right moment is there. And there's no discussion about it. There's no arguing about it. There's no like, oh, oh wow, boss. It's just basically the right person at the right time shows up and you go for it. And that's what was my feeling when Bob you know, took the reins. So. <laughs> Thank you, Cornelius. Um, so that's Lucille over your shoulder like a guardian angel. So let's go straight to her. She's one of the um, beloved spirits who is going to hover over this community forever, as Galway is in CD. This is in 1844. Explorers John Fremont and Kit Carson discovered Lake Tahoe, quotation from a guidebook. In 1841, Washoe children swam like otters in the lake. Their mothers rinsed red beans. In 1842, Washoe warriors began to dream dried bones and hollow reeds. They woke clutching their shields. In 1843, Washoe elders began to speak of grass hunched in fear and thunder sticks over the mountain. In 1844, Fremont and Carson, <laughs> and that's how it ends. <laughs> Here's a, a couple of other of her uh, Sierra poems. This is Highway 89 toward Tahoe. It's her great short lines. A congregation of red rocks sits at attention, watching the water, the trees among them. Russell, Hosanna, Hosanna. Something stalls the rental car. Something moves us, something moves us, something in the river, Christ rowing for our lives. That's Lucille. And this haiku is Lucille. Over the mountain and under the stars, it is one hell of a ride. <laughs> So I need to thank uh, you, all of you for this wonderful evening and, and to thank Steve Wasserman and the staff at Heyday Books for the anthology, for their work on it and 
thank Lisa Alvarez for really imagining the shape of it into being and thank Brett for Brett Hall Jones for making and Louis Jones for making this evening possible. Um, yeah, my experience of, of uh, Squaw Valley is mostly and of the community of writers is mostly bliss and terror. I mean, to get up in the morning and, and, and write and getting to get up in the morning in this amazing collection of people. Um, so thank you all. And this is my, this is a Squaw Valley poem and it's called The Seventh Night. And for people who are listening, so you're writing a poem every day for seven days. And you get up in the morning and you go and everybody reads their new poem to each other. And there isn't too much time to talk about it a lot. And then you go off and write another one. You have the afternoon and the evening and then the next day, another one and the next day another one. And then there's the seventh day and you've, you've finally done it. And there's, uh, and uh, this is called the seventh night. It was the seventh night and he walked out to look at stars, chill in the air sharp, not of summer, and he wondered if the geese on the lake felt it and grew restless, and if that was why, in the later afternoon, they had gathered in the bay's mouth and flown abruptly, abruptly back and forth, back and forth on the easy, swift veering of their wings. It was high summer, and he was thinking of autumn under a shadowy tall pine, and of geese overhead on cold mornings and high clouds drifting. He regarded the stars in the cold dark. They were a long way off, and he decided, watching them blink, that compared the distance between him and them, his outside looking in feeling was dancing cheek to cheek. And he noticed then that she was there, a shadow between parked cars looking out across the valley where the half moon poured thin light down the pine ridge. She started when he approached her and then recognized him and smiled and said, hi, night light. And he said, hi, dreamer. And she said, hi, moonshine. And he said, hi, mortal splendor. And she said, that's good thought for a while, scent of sage or your babuena and singing in the house. She took a new tack and said, my father is a sad chair and I am the blind thumbs yearning. He said, who threw the jade swan in the chicken soup? Some of the others were coming out of the house saying goodbye, hugging each other. She said, the lion of grief paws what meat he is given cars starting up, one of the stage hands starting to uproot a pine. He said, rifling the purse of possible regrets. She said, staggering tarts, a narcoleptic moon. Most of the others were gone, a few gathered to listen. The stage hands were lugging off the understory plants. Others were rolling up the mountain. It was clear that though polite, they were impatient. He said, Goodbye, last thing. She said, so long, apocalypse. Somebody else said, time. But she said, the last boat left Hania in late afternoon. He said, goodbye, Moscow, nights like sable, mornings like the word persimmon. She said, days, mailman drinks from a black well of reheated coffee in a cafe called Mom's on the outskirts of Durango. And he said, that's good. And one of the stagehands snubbed his cigarette and said, okay, with the last of you folks to leave, please, if you can remember it, just turn out the stars, which they did. And the white light everywhere in that silence was a sheet of white paper. <laughs> Thank you guys all. Thank you for this splendid evening. And good night, Lucille. Good night, go away. Good night, CD. Well, I'm supposed to say some sort of thing to close this event, but I can't think of anything better than the seventh night. So I think that that really should be our ending. Everything has been said. 
it's wonderful just to see all your faces, to hear your work. And I think we're gonna to get to hear a little more of Cornelius. And um, please look in the chat for more information about the book and where to buy it. I think there's gonna be an interview of Bob and Sharon and Brenda that I originally did for the book, but I think it's gonna be in the Ziziva blog, blog. So look for that and buy the book, apply to the workshop. There's nothing better in this world. And Thank thanks you. Mill Valley Public Library. Yes. And Franklin Walther, The Inimitable. Let there be new flowering in the fields. Let the fields turn yellow for the men. Let the men keep tender through the time Let the time be rested from the wall Let the wall be one Let love be at the end Let there be new flowering in the fields Let the fields turn mellow for the men Let the men keep tender through the time Let the time be rested from the war Let the war be won Let love be at the end. Let love be at the end. Let love be at the end. So uh, I will say some final acknowledgments. Uh, a huge thank you to Brett Hall Jones who really does have us in her care. To Angie Brenner, the city librarian who never says no to a wonderful event like this and is so supportive of all the events that we, we ask them to host, unstinting with her resources. Uh, Franklin Walther, who does the tech behind the scenes and makes it all possible in that way. All the, the Hall family, all the poets who make this event possible and everyone who worked on the anthology, the screeners, the readers, and Lisa, the editor, thank you all for making this possible and for this wonderful evening. And if I've left anybody out, somebody should just speak up because I didn't write this down. Take care, everyone. You wanna hear more Cornelius? <laughs> Actually, more Lucille, <laughs> who got the last word, <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> Bye, folks. <laughs>